Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to see all of you here, and I'm very pleased and proud to announce our 11th webinar today, which looks on the case of Italy on migration-related changes in the organization of work in the food sector. My name is Felicity Silman, and I'm head of the networking unit Paradigm Shift, and we were working affiliated with the International Metropolis Conference for a long time now, but now the conference is over and we have a post-conference process. And this webinar is part of that process, some sort of transition towards a new network. And we use this format to present selected features we think are important and they are thought to be starting points for further research. So I'm glad that you join us and I, I want to introduce you a moment into our topic today. Why this content? Why are we speaking about the food sector again? And it is because it's such an important topic. We noticed that because of the war in Ukraine and that we have um, disturbances in the food chain in the in the in the um, in the delivering of food. And we see uh, that we here recognize only a problem we, we have for all over the world. So we speak of a global food crisis, and this is why we speak about it also here. The topic is important for many countries for since many decades. So you can see here, the, the graph is showing you that countries which are not affected that the number of undernourished people in conflict affected countries has grown in the past years, and um, that there's a link between food insecurity, conflict, and forced migration. So that would be the global scale we see here about the food sector and migration. Also, we speak of food for a lot in the past years because Food is part of the SDG2, the Zero Hunger Strategy of the Sustainable Development uh, Goals, so the SDGs. Here you can see that clearly. When it comes to migration, we must consider that the agricultural sector always is in need of migrant work. So if you look at that explanation of the international, at the International Migration Review Forum in two years, uh, this year, you can see that the Lucas Tavares, who is the officer, said that migrants labor is an indispensable element across all food systems and agricultural value chains. And it is marked by occupational accidents, by bad working conditions and ill health. So there's a special thing to migration and the food sector here, which is uh, broadly acknowledged. Now, why Italy? Italy is a very special case. And we thought it's good to shed light on Italy because here we see in Italy many migrants. We see a high importance of the food sector within the Italian economy. And this is linked also to the shortage of labor, which we see globally in the food sector. You know, maybe that new technologies are mainly used also because there's a need for workers which cannot be fulfilled. So there's a need to develop new technologies to substitute workers, for example. For Italy, uh, we see a country with an agricultural sector that is highly informal, and that is in some region, in some regions still is coined by exploitative working conditions. Um, we would rather say, of course, because we know about the Capolarato and all this mafia-like, mafia-style organization of work. And we have, a, in Italy, we have a high share of illegal and final revenue migrants too, which flow into that sector. But also a large part of the Italian employees is part of the food sector, mainly so in southern Italy and the islands, and also a large share of the Italian landscape. A third of the total territory is dedicated to food production, mainly meat and dairy products, and fruit and vegetables, grapes and wine, grains, as well as olives. And so we thought it's about time to, to concentrate on that. There's another special speciality for Italy, 
many enterprise we have many enterprises which have small territories on which they work and we have few enterprises with large territories you can see that here superficie agricola utilizzata means the, the that's the surface that is used by the agricultural enterprise and you can see that you have a lot of um enterprises with very little uh, territories they can um they can work on and on the other hand you can see here uh, very few enterprises with a large um, super, um large territories they can work on so that is very interesting our interest today is that we look on made in Italy with a closer look because I think that is missing in the debate. We have a lot of debate on a very global scale, but here we will look on the made in Italy, what it means. We all know about the exploitation. We want to go a step further. We want to understand what are possible breaking out strategies, what is found here and how does this, this connect to new technologies. We have some innovations which we see among the self-employed that might be embryonic, small and only potential trajectories to transform the agri-food change we were speaking about. But still they are there, they are in the world and they have an impact on the way the sector is organized. Thus, we first want to concentrate on process innovation. So we look on the social economy that is aiming to produce socially sustainable networks for migrant workers in highly exploitative agri-food supply chains. Our second presenter will speak then about the local and regional innovations which emerge when migrants are actively involved into the social economies. And our third contribution, our third presenter is going to focus on the product innovation. She's looking on how Bangladeshi migrants find their way to grow Asian vegetables in some parts of Italy. And then she focuses on the transnational perspective. This is the program for today. I want to introduce you into our excellent speakers. So it works that way that each speaker has 12 to 15 minutes. And then afterwards, we still have a question, answers and discussion session. And uh, our first speakers are from the Universite of University of Urbino. This is Professor Dr. Eduardo Barberes and Dr. Fabio Di Blasi, both from the Carlo Bo in Urbino. And they speak about migrant labor and sustainability in the Italian agricultural sector. Our next guest is Mrs. Federica Viganò. She's at the Hochschule Bolzen, Bolzano. She's speaking about migrant entrepreneurship in rural mountain areas, the case of our Slavelli. And we have, last but not least, Professor Dr. Elisabeth Bertuzzo. She is from the Kunsthochschule Weißensee and also in Berlin, as the NUPS is. She speaks about precisely um, Bangladeshi food transnational migration in Italy. And I'm very pleased to welcome all of you for our 11th webinar. I now give the floor to Mr. Barberis and Fabio Di Biancio, and please come up with your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Felicitas, for inviting uh, us. Uh, I will start with a uh, few minutes of introduction on the context, and then uh, Fabio will step in with the result of our uh, of our research. You already had a, a, a very uh, clear introduction on on uh, agriculture and migrant lab labor in Italy. I would ask just a few uh, 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 data more. First, it's uh, the, the 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 share of uh, legal uh, labor uh, in, uh, in in the wage labor in agriculture uh, is a relatively new uh, phenomenon. We had uh, historical. Uh, historical pockets of uh, undocumented and uh, hyper-exploited uh, work uh, in, in uh, some uh, areas of the countries in, in growing uh, some traditional made in Italy production, but uh, the waged lab labor, migrant labor in agriculture is increasing strongly in, in recent year. years. So uh, the National Institute of Statistics basically uh, says that now 
one wage to labor out of two in agriculture is a migrant. Uh, that this makes one out of seven because then there are self-employed that are mostly uh, uh, Italian, but as for the wage to labor is half migrant. Um, when we see the media uh, coverage on uh, uh, severe exploitation, we had a new law in Italy in, in uh, 2016 to, to contrast this, uh, this phenomenon and the gang mastering or capolarato. Um, so there's this idea that it's uh, something uh, uh, backwardish that came from, uh, uh, from the past. Uh, actually, it's and, and it's mainly focused in uh, uh, some pockets areas in southern Italy. Uh, actually, uh, it is much more of a structural phenomenon. Uh, we may dare to say that uh, for some production without exploitative labor conditions, that labor chains do not exist. Uh, so uh, it, it's not just being backward dishes, just how capitalism in agriculture works <laughs> nowadays. Uh, and uh, the, the, the most hit are uh, uh, migrants. Um, as for seasonality of the labor, uh, uh, low paid jobs and uh, low specialization. Uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, undocumentedness and irregularity in labor relations, even though there's a growing share of gray labor more than totally uh, black uh, uh, labor, uh, with uh, the so-called refugeeization of the labor market in agriculture, in which is not so much undocumented uh, uh, or not so longer undocumented migrants, uh, but uh, those that are in a liminal uh, 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 parallel legal uh, situation like like uh, refugees. Uh, in many cases, we have strong spatial segregation and housing uh, uh, segregation. Uh, in which uh, uh, you also had a series of problems coming from social, economic, and I would say also environmental sustainability of, of many chains that just uh, use la la uh, uh, labor migrants as a stopgap solution to their uh, general problems. In a way, the mobilization on to, to contrast uh, the, the uh, hyper exploitation of migrant labor increased a lot in uh, uh, in uh, uh, recent years, and it's not only uh, trade union mobilization; it's also assuming the form of new uh, entrepreneurship or new ways to uh, try to uh, uh, enter. Uh, traditional labor chains. And this is where I give the floor to Fabio for uh, continuing uh, the, the presentation. Yes, thank you, Eduardo. I'm presenting here uh, the results of research uh, we carried out in the context of uh, an, uh, an AMIF project, PINACU, promote, promoting active inclusion parts in the high end agricultural sector. Um, basically, the aim of the study was mapping and analyzing good practices of um, socioeconomic inclusion of migrants, uh, asylum seekers and refugees in the agri-food sectors. Um, in this map, you can see uh, there are uh, different experiences we collected in 16 regions uh, undertaken by multiple actors over the last decade or so. Um, including cases of production and commercialization of agricultural products, which are uh, trying to address the social unsustainability of uh, agricultural supply chains. Uh, today, we would like to focus on some of these um, experiences, looking specifically on at how some uh, grassroots and uh, civil society organizations, social economy actors, and migrants themselves uh, have addressed uh, the issue of labor exploitation by giving the rise to some uh, innovation processes uh, in the agricultural uh, sector. 
These uh, are 10 experiences that can be um, considered as a bottom-up response to the exploitation of labor uh, in, ag in the agri-food sector. And uh, even though um, they focus on different supply chains, they all have um, established more or less successful uh, agri-food networks that uh, make labor and specifically migrant labor uh, the core element of a new sustainability um, in agricultural production. Um, the first one of these uh, projects, uh, SOS Rosarno, was born in Calabria, in southern Italy, uh, in 2011, after the insurgency of some uh, uh, exploited uh, African workers uh, living in informal settlements, uh, with the aim to uh, fight the exploitation of uh, agricultural workers and, and small farmers uh, in the orange production. Basically, the, uh, the idea... <clears throat> has been on uh, uh, process innovation by finding uh, a new market for, for, for an old product, Orange, um, linking about 20 companies um, with solidarity purchasing groups uh, located uh, mainly in central and especially northern uh, Italy. Um, following the, the example of SOS Rosarno, uh, other projects have um, emerged. Um, in other highly exploitative supply chains and agricultural districts, as you can see uh, from this map, uh, especially but not only in, in, in southern regions, um, and especially in the, in the tomato production. There have been several experiences um, with a high concentration, as, as you can see, in Apulia region, um, which is the second largest tomato producing region uh, in Italy. Um, many of these projects basically promote small scale farming and a small scale processing of local uh, products with sustainable methods. Um, and moving to the, to the strategy they adopted uh, uh, and the innovation we can see uh, when looking at these experiences, um, firstly, we can mention the, the crucial role of nested market and alternative food networks, uh, meaning uh, different channels, different relations uh, when compared to the, to the dominant one, uh, built on solidarity, on cooperative principles, uh, and allowing, uh, above all, fair prices for farmers and fair working conditions for laborers. Um, we can note that while uh, the solidarity economy and the alternative food networks have uh, a long history uh, in Italy within the broader uh, struggle against uh, ag agricultural uh, and agro-industrial transformation, these initiatives have actually taken the issue of labor and the issue of migration within these, these networks. Um, in which there is also an active role of migrants, as they are often in involved not only as beneficiaries, but also as, uh, as promoters. Um, we can mention the case of Baricama, for example, in the Lazio region, which is, uh, which was, which is promoted by seven uh, Black African migrants. Um, it is a, a case of self-entrepreneurship, uh, but they are also uh, promoting uh, the inclusion of some um, disabled Italian people through social farming. Um, some of other features uh, of these experiences are related to uh, the way agricultural products are uh, distributed and commercialized, uh, meaning short chains, direct selling channels, uh, also by adopting uh, transparent pricing systems and labels. Um, in which, um, in some cases, the the price, the selling price of the produce is is um, com composed is shown uh, by the different stage of the production process, including the the cost of labor, and because of the close relation they establish with consumers and other uh, actors, uh, some of these projects have been able to uh, are actually able to uh, fund every agricultural season in advance using uh, the system of online pre-orders of of Customers. Um, and it is also worth mentioning that all these projects reinvest their profits in, in social uh, initiatives, uh, also in, in the informal settlements where many uh, laborers uh, live, trying to improve their living condition. And perhaps the most uh, interesting aspects of, of such experiences 
uh, is that in some cases they are beginning to involve local conventional companies at the local level, suffering um, the unequal power relations within the agri-food systems. Um, also, by adopting some innovative tools, such as the network contracts, uh, allowing to share production means, uh, resources among different companies uh, joining the network and thus improving their um, economic sustainability. Um, this is the case, for example, of Povero. Uh, the next slide. Uh, thank you, Eduardo. Um, this is a um, project uh, producing organic tomato sauce on land sites from organized crime. Um, since 2021, 20, uh, uh, the project has its own processing unit, processing facility, and therefore began to involve some local conventional companies uh, buying their, their tomatoes. Um, the commercialization through alternative food networks allows the, this project to offer a higher price for tomatoes, for organic tomatoes, uh, than conventional buyers. As you can see, um, they pay tomatoes 31 cents um, when conventional buyers linked to large processor and supermarkets pays nine uh, or 20 cents uh, per kg. And by asking other companies to join the network contract, uh, this is used as leverage to demand fair working conditions to companies join the, 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 the network, the contract. And interestingly, some the social cooperative, which is leading the, the project, uh, the Cooperativa Pietro di, Sca Pietro di Scarto, um, is experimenting with the system of labor sharing, which is uh, regulated by the, the, the network contract. And, uh, um, the company is proposing the price per plant system um, to other companies. Um, in this case, the, the, the social cooperative uses its workers on other companies' land for the harvesting of tomatoes, offering a price of 18 cents, uh, which includes the cost of labor, but is still much higher than the price offered by, by conventional buyers. Um, Moving to the challenges we see uh, that can be identified in, this, in these experiences, um, clearly uh, the size and volume of these initiatives are limited. Um, the small market for ethical products and the uh, small size of production and processing uh, operation um, actually limited the capacity to impact the broader uh, agri-food system and, uh, and labor market. Um, and this is also reflected uh, in the limited number and, and weak stability of, of the employment that is generated by these projects. Um, in some cases, um, especially in the tomato chains, um, we found out that migrant seasonal workers prefer uh, the employment in conventional farms, even though they are uh, super exploited, uh, because these farms can, can offer more working days during a given season. Uh, so there is a competition for labor uh, at the local level. Um, there is also some competition between the different initiatives or, or however limited uh, cooperation, which prevents somehow the, to, to scale up. Um, it can also be noted that some difficulties related to uh, project and supply chain management. Uh, indeed, some of these experiences failed uh, after a few years. Um, and lastly, especially when looking at uh, migrant self-entrepreneurship, um, we can also mention that while the creation of new market niches for socially sustainable products allows actually migrants to break in, um, it should also be noted that there are a number of barriers um, that prevent them from breaking out uh, of, of these niches, um, starting from the lack of financial and human resources up to institutional and uh, migration policy related uh, uh, factors. Um, I think I'm done. Yeah. So I don't know if you, Eduardo, want, want you. No, no, I'm more? okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much for that presentation in which we see that the role of new technologies is crucial for those social economies. You spoke of online ordering, crowdfunding, or things you cannot do without a technological setup, which allows for that. Okay, thank you so much. Our next presentation is uh, Federica Vigano. Federica, would you open your screen for us? And yes. thank you, the two of you, for sticking to the time. That's really kind. Federica. 
please. Yeah. I'm trying to, so it's okay. So thank you very, very much for inviting me and uh, with my presentation, we will zoom into a regional case, which is the case of uh, the Aosta Valley, uh, a region which is uh, located in a rural mountain area. Uh, exactly at the opposite where I am because I am based in Bolzano and my university is uh, exactly on the border close to Austria and this is close to France and we will see a case uh, of uh, migrant entrepreneurship. Not going. Okay. This is just a quote from one of the interview. I, I just uh, introduced it by saying this is a sort of successful case of integration where we can appreciate uh, the dynamics uh, which has been uh, um, with occurred in this region in the case of some uh, uh, migrant and migrants which uh, were funding their business uh, uh, in uh, in Val d'Aosta. Um, the aim of uh, this work, it was a paper, it, uh, I have to say it is pre-pandemic, so also data are referring to some a couple of years ago, let's say. This paper examined a multiple case of, of the relational route that have been taken by successfully small migrant firms located in this uh, uh, area of northern Italy. And I will focus on exactly on the dynamics occurring in the case of rural migrant businesses and how they have positioned their business in the local and global supply chain in the region. The main findings uh, uh, enable to um, uh, highlight the concept of translocal embeddedness of migrant business, but we will see in a minute. I don't know why it's not. Uh... Uh, I would like also to uh, to read uh, this case uh, in the light uh, of social in, uh, innovation. The case of uh, migrant entrepreneurship in rural areas are uh, a good example of social innovation, and uh, we can uh, uh, take uh, the social innovation using the lexicon of the new economic sociology as the result of embeddedness. Uh, uh, that's to say the embedding of business in the social network of the local community. These migrant business respond to a culturally connotated demands uh, when they serve their compatriots, let's say their, um, the people of their own country, but they are also doing another kind of effort. They try to integrate, to integrate into the local business. And innovation, as we will see, takes the form of the integration and natural capacity. Um, just to present uh, the framework of the research, I uh, have done some quantitative analysis and qualitative analysis. We have used the uh, data from the Chamber of Commerce, and then we have uh, done uh, narrative interviews with the six entrepreneurs and four testimonials of local association and networks. And then we have analyzed the data through thematic analysis and content analysis. Let's say that may, the main aim was to understand the inner dynamics, the exogenous, but also the endogenous factor explaining the level of integration and embeddedness in the, into the social context. If we can frame a couple of research questions that have guided uh, the analysis, the first uh, is referred to the influence of the structural dimension. That's to say society, market condition, and embeddedness uh, of this uh, local business in the, in the local community. And the second will be how they integrate their business in the global and local supply chain. Uh, to have a look with a look to the uh, data, uh, Italian data uh, of the Chamber of Commerce uh, taken into three different years, 2012, 2015, 2018, we can see that uh, uh, there is uh, an interesting uh, uh, increase of migrant uh, firms, migrant entrepreneurs in Italy, specifically coming from uh, uh, 
Morocco, China, Romania, Albania, Bangladesh, Senegal. Of course, there are also other foreign business because when we take the foreign business, uh, of course, we include also um, entrepreneurs coming from Germany, for instance, or from Switzerland. But of course, we are focusing on migrant entrepreneurs. And it is uh, uh, relevant to see that uh, uh, from this country, the number of firms are really growing. In the case of Val d'Aosta, uh, I'm making the case of uh, rural mountaineering areas uh, located, as I was saying, in uh, the northwestern part of the Alpine uh, Arc. And uh, uh, being a mountaineering territory, there are some uh, specific characteristics like uh, a sort of permanent uh, geographical, structural geographical disadvantage uh, given by physical factor and anthropic factor. And uh, specifically, the economy is marked by a strong seasonality and also the, regula the regulation of the use of resources. Uh, in the mountaineering areas, there are always extra costs, uh, which has to be taken into consideration. Uh, this is just to say that these areas are not very attractive normally for the normal business, let's say. Instead, uh, in the in recent year, there was an increase uh, in this uh, region of foreign entrepreneurship and specifically migrant entrepreneurship. Here you can see where they come from. I mean, the origin and the number of the uh, migrant uh, enterprises that we have considered from Morocco, from Tunisia, Romania, Albania, and China. Of course, as I was saying, there are also people, um, sorry, migrants uh, uh, coming from Germany, Belgium, France, and Switzerland. We are speaking, of course, of a region which is a cross-border region close to France. So uh, this is also interesting because uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, migrants come from Morocco and Tunisia because also they share the same language and this is an advantage, of course. Coming to sectors, uh, uh, most of the migrants are working, uh, we, we can see mostly are, sorry, sorry, uh, in the construction sector. But the case that I have taken into consideration are those working in the commercial activities, including the catering industry connected to the local food production, and specifically the wine sector is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, at stake in this case. The profile of the firms that we have analyzed, uh, the uh, migrants interview are working exactly in the catering services and the wine sector. And this is a case of, uh, let's say, meso level, if we want. In this region, uh, uh, this, uh, this case of migrant entrepreneurship show how the activities developed by the migrant firms become really part of the local supply chain, integrating the business in the social context and in the local market. And you will see uh, the networking activities are uh, predominant and uh, are really the driver that they use to integrate them in, in, the, in, in, the, in the local community. Uh, yeah, just, uh, just uh, uh, I, I, I'm not going to read everything, but just to give you the idea of the uh, uh, qualitative analysis, this is the thematic analysis to extrapolate patterns. And we have analyzed four main patterns the entrepreneurial experience, the integration, the level of integration in the local society and local market, the role of institution and the territorial attractiveness. And secondly, we have run also a content software-based analysis uh, with NBVO software, which was uh, uh, very useful to filter out uh, um, the main uh, aspect uh, which were coming out from the occurrence uh, uh, of, uh, of the word uh, which uh, were mainly used by word and not just word by the by the interview. I'm going to present the the, the result uh, uh, by keeping uh, by filtering the most relevant uh, uh, results. 
the the first question was about the relevance of the structural dimension the society the market condition and the embeddedness uh, to support the migrant entrepreneurs and this is uh, interesting because two points were coming out central to this concept uh, is the manner in which migrants uh, as, no as knowledgeable agents uh, use their understanding of the rule of interaction and use the formal and informal networks to create opportunity for action then we will give some content to this uh, abstract uh, concept and the second is that migrant entrepreneurship can be understood as a mode of emplacement uh, as migrants afford to settle and build networks of connection within the constraints and the opportunity of the locality. What does it mean and what, how they integrate their business in the local and global supply chain? First of all, it is to be noticed that they are not occupying the vacancy chain of the local, let's say, economy, but they are exploring other sectors where they can bring, for instance, their own food production, there were examples of uh, uh, companies importing food and activating exchanges with their home countries. Or the other option is to integrate themselves in the local food supply chain. And this was the case, the second point of wineries, because they are developing an association of migrants which collaborate with local business, specifically with the wine, uh, wineries uh, uh, in, the, in the region. A third element, which was, uh, let's say, coming out, was that uh, they have also a potential uh, to make an evolution towards transnational entrepreneurship. Some of them were really, uh, even if it was a small business, they were uh, activating, as I was saying, exchanges, sort of import from their home countries of food and then distribution of this food at the local level. Um, if we look at uh, the innovation, which was one of the lens that we have used uh, in this paper, um, first of all, uh, there is uh, this capacity to connect to the well-developed local business, in this case it was the wine sector, by founding this association of migrants uh, who, were, uh, who was providing also skilled workers to the wineries. The second was uh, exactly to improve uh, and develop skills and competencies for the local uh, business production. This is connected to the institutional factors. They were really profiting from uh, educational offer at the local level and working also uh, always as, a, as an association. And third, there was also a work on the cultural level, which is uh, also important uh, because uh, they, there is another association made of the same people, let's say, that was uh, uh, mainly working in the society by bringing their tradition, for instance, uh, the hammam or the nargile was mentioned, um, or the traditional products of their home countries in the local context, but they were uh, sort of uh, helped or supported by a cultural association which was uh, um, spreading, let's say, this kind of uh, uh, elements uh, in the society. As a conclusion, uh, I would like to remind that uh, it is a mountaineering area, so there is an important role uh, in the choice of investment because uh, it is a size, uh, sorry, it is a, a small market size, not very attractive for um, other business, but this uh, characteristic uh, were given security to the migrant entrepreneurs. And they made also uh, of the of being of being Valdosta border region. They made uh, a favorable factor of this condition. The second uh, conclusion is that the migrants entrepreneurs were capable of holding their own market space, and they also look for new development opportunities through innovative channel. They are working a lot on local networking, but also using technologies uh, in a way, using and developing, for instance, e-commerce. And uh, the third element, which was important, was about uh, um, the training and uh, skills and competences, uh, professionalization, we can say, 
of this uh, migrant firm, which was uh, really one element uh, uh, present in the case uh, of, the, uh, of the migrant firms analyzed. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have finished my presentation. Thank you very much, Federica. That's been very insightful, especially so because you speak about the technologies and the new opportunities which are created by the migrants. So beyond the local space. And I think this is what we are going to hear also from Elisa a bit more in detail for another group. And I would open your presentation now, Elisa, and it's Thank your you turn. Yes. Um, hello. Elisa, thank you for inviting me. Um, I have to, uh, yeah, let uh, to say by way of a disclaimer that the observations that I will be sharing here are not at the stage of published research yet. Um, they are still quite raw. Um, and the outcome of preparatory field work that I carried out in a very explorative style since 2021. I am an urban sociologist, uh, normally working in Bangladesh and India. And it is only last year that I launched on research in Italy out of a curiosity for the lives of Bangladeshi immigrants in the country. Because of my previous research in Bangladesh, I know that one cannot draw the balance of migration by only considering the pros and cons at one side of the migration. And therefore, it is necessary to approach migration as a two-sided or even multi-sided phenomenon. Therefore, in my future research, I am going to link the experiences of immigration in Italy to their correspondence in Bangladesh, urban and rural scapes by considering the impact of remittances for building and real estate investment, local businesses, education, family planning, and also agriculture. Uh, thus, I'm hoping to trace stories that are not only Italian and or Bangladeshi, but global in the double sense of caused by global phenomena, including climate change, and pertaining to social and physical infrastructures that span the globe. Uh, next slide, please. Mm, labor immigration from Bangladesh to Italy uh, is a comparatively recent phenomenon of 30, 40 years. Um, an interesting evidence that I could already document is that since early, since early on, there has been a correlation between the inflow of Italian foreign investment in Bangladesh textile industry and the incremental arrival of Bangladeshis in Italy. It is also apparent that the sanatorie or amnesties implemented by consecutive Berlusconi governments in the early 2000s have played a role, allowing for Bangladeshi migrants who had attained permanent residency or been naturalized to apply for the reconjungimento, the rejunction of their family members. And more recently, they have made large and clever use of Italy's provisions concerning the issuing of seasonal agricultural labor visas, whereby from my interviews, it also transpired that in some cases, the Bangladeshis settled in Italy extend invitations to countrymen against compensation, helped by a certain holiness or porosity of the Italian laws and law enforcement. Um, by now, Bangladesh is for one of the country's largest immigrant populations, uh, um, with statistics of 2020 ranging between 160,000, this is the government data of Italy, and 400,000, that is the um, government uh, and UNDP data of Bangladesh. They mostly live in the regions of Lazio, Lombardia, Veneto, and Sicily, with the largest concentrations recorded in the cities of Rome, Milan, and Venice. Next slide, please. I approached the field following anthropologist Anna Singh's encouragement not to tell hopeful stories, but to tell terrible stories with hope. In fact, during my research, I have come across terrible stories, high precarity, visa insecurity, favoring the merest forms of exploitations of laborers on the part of Italian as well as Bangladeshi employers, 
individual biographies and families broken by the trauma of illegal migration, human trafficking. In such a scenario, a story that I feel could and should be told with hope is that of the hemerokorik vegetables, which Bangladeshis have been growing all over Italy for now a decade. The scientific term hemerokori defines the conscious or unconscious distribution of cultivated plants or their seeds and cuttings by humans into areas that they could not colonize through their natural mechanisms of spread, but in which they are or become able to maintain themselves without specific human help. For the cultivators I interviewed, the wish to cook deshi food or food of their country and the necessity to accept to access it at affordable prices were the catalysts of this cultivation. But when the, the vegetables managed to break in into the Italian market and beyond, thanks to the high demand by different migrant communities, an unexpected business opportunity and a very new supply chain have started to emerge. Next slide, please. Um, my first encounter with Italy's new hemerocoric vegetables occurred in a freshly revamped market of Mestre in Venice um, hinterland. The sellers and owners, all from Bangladesh, told me they had customers from South, Southeast and East Asia. Yet since COVID-19, the cheaper prices and constant supply were compensating for the skepticism about the unfamiliar greens among Italian buyers too. The market for deshi shopji or Bangladeshi and South Asian vegetables, however, was much more far flung and already extended beyond Italy. This started to become apparent when I visited two cultivators who did not only lease fields any longer, but grew vegetables on land of their own further in the interiors of Venice. Uh, it was summer 2021, and they were just about to buy 14 additional hectares of land in Sicily. The climate further south would make cultivation cheaper as no greenhouses would be required. Additionally, there was the possibility to grow fruits like papaya and mango. If the endeavor succeeded, the cost of transportation allowing, they saw chances of conquering the European market in Asian vegetables. A market that until now has been reliant on imports from other continents channeled through UK, as well as on the vegetable grown in Dutch greenhouses. Although this was not at all their concern, I wondered whether the vegetables grown by these pioneers, which already benefited consumers in many parts of Europe by being more affordable and unburdened the environment by not requiring long distance transport might in the near future also prove fitter for the changing climate and thus contribute to improving the old continent's food security overall. Next slide. Um, as concerns the two-sidedness of migration, this became once again apparent as we were discussing about that summer's extreme dryness and the temperatures which were becoming higher with unforeseeable consequences for the climate, including the higher frequency of floods. This was something they were acquainted with, one of the two partners noted, but that Venice and its territory were going to be affected by the increasing sea level, like Bangladesh, made him burst out. We fled from there because floodings and river erosion were making our lives hell. Now we're making a life here, but who knows for how long. Next slide. I make a move and zoom in into the Agro Pontino. This is a vast region between Rome and Naples, which was transformed from a swamp into an operationalized territory for agriculture already in the times of fascism. In spite of its um, currently of its nowadays threatened ecology, it remains a highly productive agricultural area for Italy. Around Terracina, I met two brothers who leased 10 hectares of land, partly provided of greenhouses, and sold their produce directly at a number of local weekly markets, as well 
as to wholesale dealers based in Rome and Naples. Um, at the time, again, uh, again, July 2021, they were employing 16 men aged between 18 and 60, all from Bangladesh. Some of them walked me through the ordered plots and showed me that now it was even possible to grow kulmi shark, a type of spinach that develops in the monsoon and post-monsoon season and grows in water. Someone had thought to replace the water through a capillary network of pipes that moistened the plants continuously. The Italian soil, they stated, Eco and many other persons I have interviewed ever since, was highly suitable for Bangladeshi vegetables. As a matter of fact, far less fertilizer was needed here than they used to apply back at Daesh. Next slide. To me, the employer's stories uh, spoke to a handling of laws that I would have to call dynamic and doubtless, doubtlessly some degrees of neglect for Italy's labor laws transpired. But they also conveyed pride of having managed as members of a comparatively new migrant community, something that no other migrant community in Italy has managed to do at such a scale so far, gaining access to cultivable, cultivable areas of considerable size, um, interacting with authorities and neighbors, importing seeds from their home country, producing them out of imported vegetables and fruits, mobilizing official visa provisions for agricultural labor in order to employ and partly regularize their countrymen. Compared to the stories told before or mentioned by Eduardo and Fabio, many of the laborers I interviewed in this and other farms were aware of working under extremely hard conditions, yet expressed relief on not having to experience the mass slavery enforced by the mafia-like system of caporalato in Italy's fields. Um, next slide, I jump again and go to Sicily and come to an end. Whereas the south of Sicily is known as a hardly penetrable domain of the Caporalato's network of violence and exploitation, Bangladeshi farmers have set food in the northern regions, and I found Palermo's iconic market, Ballarò, full of the vegetables they cultivated in areas such as Bagheria, east, 20, 40 kilometers east of Palermo, and in the province of Trapani. However, um, here I would like to report on my visit in the Orto Urbano or Urban Garden of Fabio Aranzulla and Luca Cinquemani, an agronomist, philosopher, and an, art, um, and an artist who founded together the collective A Terra Terra in an effort to combine art, activism, and regenerative agriculture. Next slide. Apart from selecting um, seeds of ancient, forgotten, and disused or foreign breeds and growing them to distribute the produce in a growing network of buyers, including restaurants, the collective focuses on creating awareness about ecological and sustainable ways of producing food, including foraging, and uncover the legacies of Italy's and Europe's colonial past in collaboration with migrant communities, also the Bangladeshi communities. Um, the small aubergine, it doesn't look like an aubergine, or I was surprised that it is an aubergine, but it is a, um, a, a protected uh, local product under the name of Melanzana Rossa di Rotonda, red aubergine from Rotonda. Um, this breed, although it is called red aubergine from Rotonda, uh, reached the peninsula carried by Italian soldiers whom the newly created Italian state had sent to colonize Ethiopia at the end of the 19th century. So recently, within a public intervention, a terra terra renamed the vegetable Ethiopian red aubergine. My last slide. Um, much like the seeds of Corolla, Sheen, Shak, Chichinga, landing in Italy with the facts that are all to be seen and that push forth our understanding of the inter and even intra-relational nature of contemporary environmental and ecological processes, 
the transnational migration of the Bangladeshi men I presented here is an open-ended process with cause consequences and repercussions that evade the Italian setting. I believe the case I presented allows for us to see environmental crisis as well as migration as facilitators of involuntary, temporal, temporary, casual, even odd juxtapositions and interrelatings of heterogeneous elements. If migration promotes technological transfer from the global south to the global north here, there one starts to think about extreme soil contamination in Bangladesh, result of a facade industrial development and monoculture, and a known co-impactor of migration. I hope I have been clear and thank you for the attention. Today I want to stop here. Thank you, all of the speakers again. <laughs>